I'm starting the recording. I thought we were going to do that at the same no, time. No, no, no. That's just my backup. Okay. That, so that's just if shit hits the fan, I have a recording on my computer of each of us. Everything. Got it. Yeah. So audacity is the way we're going to go. And then you do yours and that would work out well. All right. Now we're ready to start recording. Jess, countdown. One, two, three, record. Yeah. You're so excited for your clap. I was okay. ready to clap. I was early on the clap. So we're going to go one, two, three, clap. Close enough. That was give, horrible. We weren't even close. Give me one more. People. Give me one more. One, <laughs> two, three, clap. I don't know why that this was is worse. so hard for y'all. <laughs> it's the delay. We are. We have a signal that goes from Massachusetts to to Boise over to Orlando, there's bound sure. to be a little lag somewhere oh, in there, sure. right? That's nuts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just want you to, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to lean into your microphone and on the count of three, I'm gonna go one, two, three, and then I want you to say your own name, okay? <laughs> one, two, three, Jessica. Nice. All right, we good? <laughs> Pretty good, okay. Wait, I may make sure I'm still recording in stereo. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's a good point. I forgot. Maybe my settings. It I mean, defaults to that, I think so. But I was just making sure. Sorry, Mark. See how we're, we're experts on this. Okay. What was it again? Go to what? In the middle, it'll be like stereo recording channel or something like that. Track size. No. It should okay, default to that. You should be all right. So right above your track, you see, it's kind of in a, they're kind of grayed out. If you're already recording, you can't change it, but it should say to okay. stereo recording channel. You see that? There's going to be a uh, speaker icon and just to the left of that, it'll say two parentheses stereo recording channel. Mm -hmm. Third or fourth bar down. Mine says stereo 44, 100 hertz, 32 bit float. Can you share your screen just real quick? <laughs> just see what you're looking at. We still want to be recording, right? Yeah, that's fine. Since we started it, you want to go on it? It's fine. <laughs> okay, good. You're fine. See, that says two stereo recording channel. No, but I'll take uh, your word for uh, it. Uh, look up look up above the, the numbers yeah it doesn't matter uh, we're good okay cool yeah <laughs> all right okay clap for me one more time okay one two three clap all right i think we're good god dang let's get this over with that was the third clap just right there fine all right, now we would hear the introduction that Jess would be giving. And <clears throat> welcome, everybody, to the Planning Commission podcast. We have a fantastic episode ahead of us. Fenton is a fan of gangster rap and 10 more fun facts about the mustache mover. Yes, indeed, our guest today is Mr. Mark Fenton, who will be introduced momentarily, and we can't wait to talk to him, and we thank him very much for him and participating on this podcast for all three of our listeners. So as we get started, let's kick this session off with, as we do every week, Mr. Don, don't call me Dan Kostelik, what is our whiskey pairing du jour, Mr. K? Uh, I saw this one a few weeks ago and was saving it for the Fenton episode. So uh, this is a great one. This is not out yet, so I can't physically show you the bottle. Uh, we're going to start with Johnny Walker. That. And they have a new black label called the Keep Walking City Collection that's coming out that has artists from Mexico City, Delhi, uh, Istanbul, and Bangkok. And contributing things to that but johnny walker black the walking city collection so it should be in stores july through september of this year try to find some and if you do send it to me <laughs> thailand you're, you're a bit of thailand no no i have <laughs> i uh it's a beautiful place but there's definitely some things happening in that country that makes me wonder what's being contributed to the whiskey. Just if saying. They did different things. Oh my gosh. Down those streets. 
it's it's quite the scene let me just tell you um well we'll see I'll, when the bottle comes out if they accurately portray <laughs> it with the public art <laughs> i i i'll say this much i saw some things that i really could have gone a lifetime without seeing how about that really? that's fair well navy man you know you were in the service <laughs> so supposedly the rite of passage of you know people's making sure i saw some things and damn it if i did so anyway all right in a bit we're gonna talk with mr fenton himself but for now i want to kind of open it up a little bit and and some things y'all don't know about us right we're we're definitely every week every episode you're getting a chance to know the three of us but obviously we're going to continue to divulge more and more for better or worse so we're going to kind of share a few things about us that you don't know. I am a big fan of gangster rap for one thing. I know is I, I know Don is as well, but those aren't my three things. My three things pretty quickly here. I think when I was about seven, I almost died in a parasailing accident. I owned a Bahraini driver's license and drove in Bahrain, which was just fun. And I happen to own a U.S. trademark patent on a planning process only because someone blatantly ripped off my idea and it was a protective measure. Oh, my so, gosh. <laughs> right. Yes, you could imagine my frustration when that happened. His so gears are, were ground back then. My that's for gears sure. were ground to a pulp. And <laughs> yes, I was massively frustrated for a number of reasons. But those are a few things about me that uh, nobody knows about. So what's the parasailing story? Hicks, Rita. My family were Hicks. <laughs> um, most people parasail over the water in a oh. boat or with a boat, right? Not my family. Thanks for asking. So my stepdad, bless his heart, as Jess would say in the South, um, was a big skydiver. And we happen to have a parasail. Now, did we do this with a boat and over water where it was safe? No. Oh, our redneck Hick family went out to the middle of the desert, tied up a rope to the back of a dually truck and just punched <laughs> it on a dirt road until little Chris got aloft up into the sky. Only guess what happened on this particular time? Stepdad wasn't around. And I don't think any of my family knew how to tie a knot other than in their shoes. <laughs> and so they tried to tie the little knot to the back of the truck and off we went. Oh, yeah, I went airborne. All right. But then the rope snapped. The harness broke. It smacked me in the face. I was a bloody pulp. And I was floating right toward a Joshua tree. <laughs> and if you know what a Joshua tree, it's not kind to the human body. And just before I careened into this thing, and I don't know how fast I was, my uncle, as if he was some sort of superhero, reached up with a hand, grabbed my little foot with a little cowboy boot on and pulled me to safety. But within a few seconds, I would have been a mashed pulp of a human being. And I yeah. Imagine if we'd had smartphones back then. The parasail never came out after that. It went up for sale. And there's a great, <laughs> there's a great black and white picture of me about a minute before that, that I'll have to share someday at another time. Well, it reminds so me of are... what they've always said about land-based parasailing. Yeah, it's you're stupid. either good or you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's such a sad story, though. Right. Yes. Well, yes, I survived. You would have really never good. invented Cool Ranch Doritos. If I that would not happened, have right? invented Cool Ranch Doritos. <laughs> oh my another, gosh! Another story for another day. But yes, another one of those fun Chris facts of Cool Ranch. And now I'm trying to undo the harm that Cool Ranch Doritos has plagued humanity on. <laughs> so, Don, give me your three facts. What do we got? I was just thinking the daily food laws can be another uh, <laughs> yes. version of that. So yeah, <laughs> my, my three facts, uh, 2000, 2001 major league baseball seasons. I saw pretty much every major league baseball player and coach naked. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a club reporter, what's that? Slugger. <laughs> Slugger. <laughs> well, yes. Um, I got some of those stories too. So, um, hey, ooh, yeah. Um, I have a clogging trophy back oh, in yes. growing up in Southern Appalachia in elementary school. I was in different clogging competitions and, uh, did that, I guess, well enough in an individual competition of shuffling my feet around. I got a trophy. Love What's it. that for Jess? What's that little laugh? You know what clogging is. 
we yeah. did it I did it at Santa's land. Now, if you don't know Santa's land, it is a Santa Claus theme park in Cherokee, North Carolina. That's as tacky and ratty as it sounds. No. Were you an elf? <laughs> Were you a clogging elf? Uh, no, but that would have been a, that would have been a good oh, stick. Oh man, that would have been a good twist. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And the third one was as a cub reporter for the student newspaper at DePaul University in Chicago, I interviewed a very young Barack Obama as he was running for the Illinois state legislature. Wow. This is, this is not even fair. I have nothing cool like that. I mean, mine are cool, but they're not. You no, they're not. They're not. <laughs> I'm sure you've got some good stuff. I, I keep waiting for the adult performance of your clogging someday. When we just had the 4th of July, you should have been on my drive. I'm going to see clogging. if my mom got Gosh, like our old you. Kmart camcorder videos converted yeah, to DVD. Yeah, yeah, you could probably yeah. see it. I do have pictures. I do have pictures. I, I love it. I love it. All right, Jess, what's your three? Come on, give me something good. Make it up if you have to. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I have had a ham radio, amateur ham radio license. Oh my God, what a nerd. Oh, sorry. For, no, wait, wait. For 26 <laughs> years. What? <laughs> 26 years. So how are you, why are you broadcasting this to Antarctica or something so we could get a fourth listener? Oh, no kidding. 26 years ago, you started ham radioing it up. I love it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And because I was so young when I, I, you have to study and pass exams. I passed three exams, um, two of the, whatever, whatever the first ones are. And they're different now, by the way, I think I'm actually a higher <laughs> licensure than I was at the time. Um, because at the time there was something called like a technician plus and the way you got your technician's license and you got the technician plus is you had to pass a Morse code test. <laughs> <laughs> Holy and cow. What a I bucket of fun. <laughs> First of all, I was real good at Morse code. And so what ended up happening is years later, last fall, I was at my uh, team summit for work and they did, um, an escape room, like these real, you know, yeah. it's very techie, wonderful, smart, creative people on my team. They made a escape room at our office and we competed with like, they divided us in two teams and then we competed. And one of the clues you needed to know Morse code and oh, I was nailing it. So that's my one thing. And then, um, what question was it real? ham or was it actually spam they were calling ham uh, oh that's bad that's so bad yes. that's so bad yes. try that again wah, yeah, I, wah. yeah say all the puns always because yes they might all right, be what are your what okay are my second one, my second one my second one um i uh almost burned the house down when i was a little kid oh who didn't um, yeah how did you do I it mean, though yeah, but here's the thing. It wasn't like real <laughs> fire. Uh, you, you remember those, those, this is in the eighties, right? They had those candles that were actually a little light bulb on them. And those light bulbs got so hot. Oh, like the oh. Christmas ones you put in your window. Yeah. Okay. But this yeah. one was plugged into the wall. I don't know why it needed that kind of power. And it, <laughs> and it I knocked it over and I was like, I'm definitely going to get in trouble for this. And I saw it start to burn the carpet. We had that old, yeah. And I was like, yeah, I should, I should definitely leave the scene of this crime. And so oh I left gosh. the room and shut the oh. door. <laughs> oh, wait. Um, yeah. I, my mom came back to smoke and flames, little burnt part in the carpet. They're like, what are you doing? <laughs> so you were smart enough to pass a Morris code test and ham radio <laughs> test, but not smart enough to realize if I just simply pick this thing up, everything will be cool. Hey, look. And smoking like a millennial, not understanding things used to have to be plugged in. We didn't oh. have LED right. stuff and light USB, and, and batteries yeah. and all that oh, stuff. Yeah. yeah. All right. And what's look, your third one? I'm just saying my motivation was to not get in trouble. I get and it. I get to it. this day, that's the first time I've admitted that that actually was me. It could have been any number of Ooh. my siblings. It was a big family. Oh my God. It's breaking my news. Own. Breaking yeah. news, right? <laughs> Mom just heard it. You're grounded. Okay. So with the ham radio, uh, this last thing is probably not that surprising, but if it was ever a secret, I was homeschooled my oh. entire life. Oh, goodness. Yes, I, well. K through 12. And um, no one ever taught me to read. I just figured it out. So you're an engineer. <laughs> wait, wait, so you're an engineer who was homeschooled and you can talk to people? 
<laughs> and I'm and hyperlexic, you... so it doesn't even wow. make any sense. <laughs> Why, this is getting deeper. Wait a minute. Well, who passed you if they didn't teach you to read? <laughs> Isn't that yep. sort of a foundational piece? It's not required no, no, no. in Western North I, Carolina. I, Come on. Good. Especially I when you know, you know Morris code. <laughs> I can read English. Um, well, that's I, refreshing. <laughs> I wasn't sure what language you were just, going with. but No, it's called, it's called being hyperlexic. So sometimes this happens with children. They just figure it out instead of someone teaching them to read. Like you're supposed to read your kids a thousand books before they are ready to read. Oh, okay. Okay. Did you do that? Did you parents do that to your children? Read them a thousand books. My of kids going to gate next year and just <laughs> finished a 500 page book on vacation in one day. I'm like, who are you? I don't know. Excellent. I got all those God. Pizza Hut pan pizza coupons back oh, in my day, so I know I was book doing it. that. Yeah, book it was the best. We were so we went it. camping and we went camping and she stayed in the tent with a fact book all day. I'm like, yeah. seriously, come on, child. But Anyway, love oh. you, Allie. All right. Well, those are some beautiful facts about us. It never ceases to amaze me what, uh, what our backgrounds are. But speaking of backgrounds, and uh, this person has a great one. It's an extensive one, and we're going to explore the heck out of it now. Let me introduce Mr. Dick Fenton. For those of you scoring at home, Dick Fenton, who's Dick? Oh, you didn't know that. Well, we know it. We know it now. Mr. Mark Fenton, but also his actual name is Richard. And Mr. Richard or Dick Fenton is a lovely mechanical engineer, but you know him as a walkability expert of all things, trying to make sure that this country is as healthy and as, as happy as possible. Mr. Fenton, welcome to the Planning Commission. It is a privilege to stand before the commission. I, I just can't tell you how proud I am to be here. <laughs> it means a lot. It's awesome. Well, we, we thank you very much for, for taking the time out of a very busy schedule that I know you have to share some things with our audience that nobody knows. And so I want you to start off with a little bit of the obvious, but maybe not all of it being obvious. Your background as a mechanical engineer um, and how the heck did did you get into this world uh, knowing that you're not a planner, but you're on the Planning yeah. Commission podcast and here you yeah. are. So tell us yeah. about that. So I, I introduced myself to those from that world. My first job out of school, I studied engineering, mechanical engineering at MIT. First job was at, at Eastman Kodak in their one of their piping divisions, you know, where they were piping chemicals. There's a lot of chemicals and making camera film. And, uh, and that's it. In fact, I had studied piping systems when I did my master's thesis and power plants. And so I introduced myself as Dick Fenton, mechanical engineer. Damn glad to meet you because, you know, that sort of fit. Love I had it. the plastic pocket protector and the big safety glasses, steel toed shoes. Did that, get you you a discount the at the, did that get you a discount at the photo mats? Oh yeah, absolutely. Are you kidding me? Every, um, and interestingly enough, I will say this, learning mechanical engineering at MIT, they're very systems oriented. It's not about how does you fit this widget into that hole. It's how does the system work? And, and I, will, I, will think, I would suggest that that's helped me in my work here later in life. You know, as I, as I had my epiphanies about physical activity and exercise and thinking about urban form, it's all about systems, isn't it? You know, I mean, planners are looking at systems all the time. So, so it may not be as absurd as it sounds on the face of it that a mechanical engineer got into this stuff. But, but how uh, does it make you feel, Mark, when you know all that from systems and system engineering and mechanical engineering, and then you get a response when you ask for more time for a pedestrian crossing at a signal, oh, no, we can't do that. Right, we'll have to look. Right. What, what, what does that make you feel like, given yeah. where you came from? It's really frustrating because people get caught in the little boxes. And, it's, and I'm not going to even just put the civil engineer you know, we say transportation engineers get caught in that box. Public health people get caught in that box when they yeah. say, well, we're going to get people to be more physically active by giving them a thermometer and tell them get more steps every day. Yeah. And you say, well, where do they live? If they live in a place where it's dangerous to go out and walk, then simply saying that is not sufficient, right? What's the system look like? So I get that same frustration. I get the frustration when the business owners say, we can't make space for bicycles on our street. We got to park cars out in front of these businesses, right? You'll say, wait a minute. Are the car, who parks those cars? Are those your, your employees? Are you really sure that's the car you want sitting in front of your house? Your, your business, maybe, you know, look at the system here. How are people accessing your store? And what, from a systemic standpoint, from a systematic standpoint, is going to work better for you? So it is really frustrating, but, you know, I, I feel like part of my mission is then to bring that systemic viewpoint, to help yeah. people think yeah. in that, with those broader lenses 
and across the entire system, not just the extra six seconds that you've got to give a, a, an older person to cross that crosswalk, right? What are the bigger implications systems? Man, and I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by how the chemical exposure that you probably endure. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> probably things you don't, you know, don't even uh, know, of course, but tell us more. Tell us a little well, bit more about Dick Fenton, the well, man. Get this. What Dick else Fenton, we got? After he gets his engineering degree, he actually goes and studies biomechanics and exercise science. I lived at places like the U.S. Olympic Training Center, and uh, and I was I worked at Reebok's Human Performance Lab. I was a sneaker guy. I was helping him make better sneakers, and and in fact, that was because I did. Here's an un, a, a fact: some people know if they've seen my talks where I use a photo. I did the most obscure event event in all of track and field. I was a competitive race walker, which is that sort of odd looking Benny Hill thing. They always play that weird music, you know, when they have them. They're speeding along. That's an event in the Olympics. I did the 50 kilometer race walk and actually competed in the 1984 and 1988 Olympic trials. Tried out. So explain for those that, that haven't watched race walking, what's, mm-hmm. what's the rule about feet on the ground, the numbers, two. the heels? Yeah, that there are two rules and they're based on best. And in fact, I know this because I studied this when at the Olympic training center with elite athletes, but the two rules, the biomechanical difference between a walk and a run is that you maintain unbroken unbro- contact with the ground. So the heel of your front foot hits the ground before your back toe comes off. And your leg is essentially straight when it passes under your body. Turns out that rule is the more important one because when we run, we use our legs like springs, right? We stretch the ligaments and muscles across the ankle, the knee, and the hip joint. Those are big springs. You get a lot of energy back every time you bound into the air, which is why we can run much faster than we can walk because it's a much more efficient biomechanical movement. When you walk, that leg stays fairly straight. So the judges, there are actual judges out there watching to make sure you don't break those two rules. You have to get that heel has to hit before the toe comes off. And your leg should be essentially straight as the supporting leg as it passes under your body or as you swing over. So, so the, um, that kind of geekness, by the way, in studying biomechanics is what got me into exercise science and a, an increasing interest in physical activity and all its therapeutic benefits, right? You know, being physically active is good for us. There's lots of research around that. And I kind of moved into that world from my work at places like Reebok and the Olympic Training Center. Really cool to work with elite athletes, but not as rewarding as thinking about the broader public health benefits. So in the uh, Olympic trials records, are you in there as Dick Fenton or Mark Fenton? Yeah, it's it's Mark. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. That's yeah, where you can my, find it. Google it. Yeah. My follow-up would be was the Soviet judge extra hard in the 88 oh. Olympic 80, 84 they boycotted, but 88 that's right. they were there. That's right. We boycotted them in 84. They yeah. boycotted us. Uh, I'm sorry, that's right. We boycotted 80 them 84. in 80. They right. boycotted us in 84. And the deal is three judges have to give you a red card. You know, in soccer, the ref gives yep, you a red card yep, and you're yep. out three different judges. So you can't have the Soviet judge give the American athlete a red card. If you, you know what I mean? Ah, three yes. judges have to turn in a card on you. So there's yeah. uh, because it, otherwise the Mexicans out front, the American judge gives him a red card. And now the Me- American is in first. So the other question um, is, so then when you hear said Benny Hill music, do you yeah, instantly break out I do. into I, I, I've been known to do it in embarrassing public venues and my family will awesome. just literally walk away and pretend they don't know me when I do that. So tell us about the mustache. I'm sure that you have plenty of facts about the well, mustache. You're the, known the, the for it. The biggest one on. is that I'm married 30 years and my wife has never seen me without one. How about that? Because Ooh. I grew this in college. <laughs> And, and then it became kind of uh, somebody new, you know, you, you know, like people got to know that, you know, the walking guy with the mustache, they wouldn't know my name, but they'd say, you know, that walking, <laughs> the guy that came to our community and did the walking workshop, or he took us on a walk, the mustache guy. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, famously, Dan Burton, right, the godfather of the walkability movement has a big bushy mustache. So I think I really, it's just my aspirational uh, uh, nod to Dan that I've had this mustache for, for all of my adult life. Yeah. So if we did like a celebrity death match between you and Dan, loser shaves the mustache. Oh my you God. You guys would go for that. It would be heartbreaking for one of us. And probably we, we just go live in a hole for our remaining years. <laughs> yeah. You can't, don't ask that of either of us. So if your wife had to trade between seeing you without a mustache or the copious amounts of clippings in the sink, which would she'll she take got? the stash? She says she's, she likes it. So she's I'm, I'm, good with the. All right, all right. She'll put she up with the clippings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and as a facial hair guy, you understand that. My wife's never seen me without, you know, at least my goatee. Really? So ah. I'm, I'm, I'm tracking right there with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. your kids are going to get used to it. That's what you're going to learn. My kids yeah. have also told me can't cut it now because that's this is the only dad they know. I'm, I'm married to my wife and my facial hair. There you go. So stumbles. Yeah, well... So I'm an avid walker and hiker, right? I've, I've done a lot of backpacking. I've done some of the long distance trails like uh, the, um, the John Muir Trail. And I did this with a couple of friends. One of the guys is actually right there in Boise, Idaho. His name's Mike Lanza. He's an outdoor advocate. He's an advocate for a lot of the good stuff that happens in your community in Boise, actually. Uh, he's also an outdoor writer. He wrote for Backpacker and he proposed to Backpacker this story that was, could you walk the John Muir Trail in just seven days? If you only had a week of vacation, most people take two to three weeks. It's 210 miles, goes from Yel uh, Yel Yosemite National Park down to Mount Whitney in California through the High Sierra. And uh, the story he wanted to write was, you could do this in a week of vacation if you can average 30 miles a day. And the way to do that is to pare down your pack to about 25 pounds, you know, make it not, uh, you know, uh, you're not trying to be a Sherpa, you're traveling light and fast and comfortably 30 miles a day. So the bottom line is there's a lot of walking in the dark, as, as you can imagine. There are some days you have to start early with the headlamp on or, or late at night, you're going a few extra. And we started that they said about the third day, they noticed me staggering anytime it got dark, even with the headlamp. And it turns out I've got some kind of a vertigo thing where I don't do really well without good full light. I use my eyes for balance, apparently, not just my ears uh, like regular people. And uh, so I earned stumbles because they were afraid I was going to pitch right over an edge into the Nevada Falls or something like well, that. I'll ask another rules question related to that. Explain how <laughs> through high, explain the rules of how through hikers get their nicknames. Yeah, it's got to be given by someone else. That's the rule. The rule is you don't give your own name. So they oh. started calling me Stumbles and I'm stuck with it now. That's the rule <laughs> for the rest of my life. So Mark, I want to know about stickiness. That was the one thing I remembered about oh, being wow. being around you. And the first time I think I really saw you give a workshop, you, you kept, everybody had all these ideas and they were coming up with like solutions to problems. And you were like, what makes this sticky? And I thought that right. was so cool. And I want you to tell wow. me about sticky. Yes. I love that. You remember that. Thank you for, for yeah. Um, so, you know, when I, I came at this from that health perspective, you know, exercise, right. I was, and then I started to sort of, in fact, I worked for a bunch of years. Here's another thing. A lot of people don't know. I spent 10 years working for walking magazine. There was a magazine called walking. It was a health and fitness magazine. And it was in that family of magazines that told you how to live a healthy lifestyle. And uh, by the way, I, famously, George Carlin spoke about it on the tonight show one night. He said, do you believe there's a walking magazine? You can hear this in George Carlin's voice. He goes, you know, what, he goes, what are they going to tell you? Left foot, then right foot, then wait, go back to the left foot again. He says, what can you write an entire magazine about? And then he said, are they going to do next breathing magazine? <laughs> in. Now out, now back in. And he's doing this whole bit. Johnny Carson is laughing his butt off, but you know, it was, there was, he's right. It was a, so, so here's the deal. Ooh. One of my big revelations when I was working for Walking Magazine is it, it, maybe we should recognize that not every place is easy to walk. We actually started giving walkable community awards. We asked Dan Burden, Chris, to be one of our, uh, our judges early on, right? Back when he was talking about walkability before anybody else was really doing it. We were, and what I started to realize is there are places that are sticky for being physically active and there are places that aren't. And that that stickiness may be more important than when some, whether somebody's told you to walk or not. In other words, do you go out for an exercise walk every day or do you choose to walk your kid to school or walk to the corner store or the coffee shop because somebody's scolding you to exercise and get your 10,000 steps? Or do you do it because it's a lovely walk? There's a beautiful sidewalk and there are plantings and you're separate from the traffic and, and it's easy to cross the street when you get to the intersection and you don't think, feel like you're taking your life in your hands. And you pass five other people who you know because others are out walking or you pass your favorite shop or uh, you know, other important destinations. Um, those all make a place, a world stickier for physical activity. So to me, um, that was sort of my big epiphany to shift from thinking about individual behavior change to thinking about how we design our communities so that we tend to be more physically active and, and, and get that, you know, the, the healthy benefits of physical activity without actually being scolded to do so. Apparently you and Jess also share something in common, which is tons of time at the mall. And, and you spent, I'm guessing much of, much of the eighties, maybe early nineties, I'm not sure, but, uh, 
trekking around the malls with lots of other people. Tell us about that. So, so, you know, back when I was at walking magazine, this thing, this movement called mall walking had come out, right? The idea was, um, and so I spent a lot of time at, with groups of blue haired, older women um, who were there at seven in the morning. Careful, man, in the your hair is kind of getting blue. Yeah, that's me. I'm there now, man. That's good. Uh, look at my stash. I got a lot of gray in there. I'm I mean, on my I guess way. Some of them, the walkers also had gray must blue mustaches. Too, yeah, that's anyway. right. Um, and, you know, we would do the whole bit about how do you select a good walking shoe? Here's a good warm up exercise. How do you stretch after your walk? Uh, but what's interesting about it is the very fact that those people were choosing to walk in malls, isn't that sort of telling? Like they had to go to the mall to walk because their main street was dead right? Because we'd abandoned uh, their main street to cars. Because that's what malls were. They were emulations of our downtowns, weren't they? When we were oh. building those things, they would replace the downtowns that we destroyed by, you know, designing them only for automobile traffic. Um, so there was a, I didn't realize it at a time. I hadn't had my epiphany. I still felt like I was going to be able to cheerlead people to exercise. Walking's the easiest exercise. You can do it anytime, any place. Doesn't cost you anything. You don't need special equipment other than a decent pair of shoes. It's a great story. Oh, I discovered that we uh, in high school, when we would skip school, we would have to drive about an hour and a half to Asheville, North Carolina, and that was where the closest mall was. So we would get there before the businesses opened. And there was all the people just swinging their arms, walking yep. laps in the mall. And we're like, what in the hell is this? Yep. It was that. And they would always have like an armed services recruiter catching people like us skipping school to try to get them there. But I saw that <laughs> and I'm going, what is happening here? And it took us yeah. a while to figure that out, I recall a story, I think it's a, it's a Walmart that's in one of the border towns of Texas, mm. that the walking conditions and the summer heat are such that they've literally put like the mile markers around the main <laughs> aisle around the periphery of that yes. Walmart because oh, yeah. people go inside and walk it. Yep. I was going right. to say, in a place like Florida, mall walking sounds fantastic. It is so miserable here right now. Mm. I just, mm. I would love that. That sounds amazing. But people are actually at the mall here it's very weird it's very strange it's not like that back home it's um, gotta I, be quite the dating scene too i mean that's where you in the mall walking yeah i mean that's like it's a small scale version of the villages <laughs> but you know what i have to i have to uh, i we gotta fact check something y'all were talking about blue haired little ladies and things like that and i don't know if you realize that it's not a natural silver blue that was a blue rinse between the 30s and the 70s and I used to go with my grandmother to her. She was my Nana. I, never I, went, knew this. I went with Nana and, and, and she didn't do this, but that smell in the salon was that it was a diluted dye that, um, oh, there you go. old lady. Yeah. Ladies that had elderly ladies, they had the silver come in and stuff. They would put a blue tint. It was very fashionable and it was sure. kind of, it's a rinse and believe it or not, I do a rinse on my hair. It's just my natural color. It's a whole, that's a whole nother thing, dyeing your hair its own color, but, um, it's, it's a, they call it a rinse. And so I just want y'all to know, it's not that you have silver hair that kind of looks blue. It was a real thing. And it's very, very fashionable until about 40 years ago. So it was probably the chemicals <laughs> Mark was coming across at Yeah, maybe it's the at. same ah! stuff that's yeah. affected my, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now it all comes clear. What's happened maybe. to this guy? Between Eastman Kodak and then the blue dye, this is the price yeah. he's paying now. Yeah. So Mark, you're always moving, 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 even with your speed of speech and things. And I love it because it, it gets me excited. But I want to <laughs> know when you're relaxing, where do you go? Well, I got I to gotta tell you, I've taken up a new sport as my alternative to walking. I still go for a walk. I love being walking in nature. Um, my ultimate aspiration, I was telling you guys earlier, my dream, my ultimate dream, I want to earn a, a, a National Park Ranger hat by volunteering in the national parks and oh, during my retirement, you know, going out and working on trails. I'd be happy to get out there and work or be a guide or whatever. Um, I like be, being outdoors. And my latest thing is I've taken up surfing. And the last oh. 10 years of my life, from age 50 on, I've been surfing. I live in New England, so it's a lot of cold water surf, which that may also explain what's going on up here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Many ways that this brain has, has suffered. Um, <laughs> um, but I find being in outdoor spaces, moving in outdoor spaces is where my body wants to be. Whether it's walking through a lovely downtown, out on a surf, uh, surf wave, uh, walking through the forest. That's, that's my place, man. There you go. 
So Mark, as we uh, wrap up our time with you, I want to throw you a little bit of a curveball mm. and uh, ask you a couple rapid fire questions cool. in the vein of still getting to know uh, Mr. Dick Fenton. Damn yeah, glad to meet you. you. Um, here we go. You ready? Yep. All right. Favorite pizza topping. Got to be pepperoni. God, that's so boring. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. That's, that's awful. Hey, well, number two, though, is anchovies. I'm oh. on there. I put them on, man. I want them on there. Wow. Pepperoni that's anchovy a... pizza is a win. Anchovy oh. toast. One of my favorite I... things I've ever had that I thought would be a dumb not never say, but it's yeah. good. But you yeah. have got to scrub that stash after you eat pizza. Yes, you do. Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Wow. Okay. N- not favorite... smooching anybody on the face. Right. What's your favorite town in the U.S. that you've you've traveled to work wise? Wow. I know you've been oh, to a lot, so I'll give you yeah. a second. Buy you some time. Have you been to all fifty states? First, yeah, of I'm. I'm proud to have. say that I have recently have. kind of topped off a, a few of the because some of the, the southeastern states slow to come to this stuff, right? Mississippi, <laughs> Alabama, right. places like that. Right. But I have now. Yeah. Oh God, really hard. Um, I know. Put you on for the me spot. though. A, a winner is interestingly enough. A, a big city is Denver because it's right mm-hmm. there at the front range. So when I make a trip to Denver, Denver's really transformed. When I lived at the Olympic Training Center, Colorado Springs, 1984, I had to go down to a downtown embassy or a consul to get a, a, a visa for some, an international team I'd made in race walking. And they said, "You park in the interior garage. You run down to the consul, get the thing, and get out of there before your car gets vandalized." 1984. You go down to that, is it with the 16th Street 16th Mall, Street which was Promenade, the beginning yeah. of a turnaround for that entire region, yeah. right, of downtown Denver. And it's built on walkability. A free natural gas powered bus runs up and down that very street <laughs> right now that I parked in a parking garage in, what, 40 plus years ago and was told, don't spend any time down there. You're probably going to get jumped and beat up. Oh. Um, yeah. um so to me, the transformation that I've seen in Denver over those decades is part of what makes me so happy about it. And that walkability, active transportation, thoughtful planning was so central to that turnaround. Yeah, it's getting small rebuilt town. as we speak. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah, it's what getting a, a major. Town? Okay. I'll bop over just because my sister-in-law lives there, Salida, Colorado. When we go out to visit Salida's out on the Arkansas River, beautifully walkable, bikeable little downtown. It's a great mountain town. Um, And unfortunately, gentrifying, you know, regular people can't even buy there anymore, which happens in so many of the smaller communities when they really invest in this. So, uh, but they're working on that. They're trying to, you know, include affordable housing and things like that. So I'll say Salida, Colorado, two Colorado towns for you. I was going to ask you your least favorite, but I know you're a man of the people and don't want to offend. So maybe, but I got to tell you, okay, I'm going to still come at it. (laughs) I'm going to only because it, the the, the land devoid of planning, Houston, Texas, (laughs) where they literally said, we will don't plan. We're not going to plan. We're just going to let the market take care of it. Yeah. The market's done a great job for you there, Houston. So much, oh, okay. so much paved surface that they suffer a, a form of flooding now that's related to the lack of impervious surface and that those 16 lane highways that they have. Breaking oh news, God. this podcast brought to you by the city of Houston. Come <laughs> on down. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> What's the worst part of traveling? Wow. It, it, it's the lost time. I I hate to lose the time in transition. I love being with people in community, but it's all that transition. Favorite movie? Oh, wow. Um, Oh, no, you're going to think I'm such a... The Princess Bride. I love it. I cry every time. I cry every time. My daughters have just discovered that we recently, and they watch it like five times in a row. So it, it gets its hooks in you for sure. What makes it your favorite? You, you it's keep, inconceivable. Yeah, you it keep is. saying inconceivable. I do not think that means what you think it means. <laughs> right? It's the best. It's the best. It's the best. And there's a lot of walking we put in a it. bike lane there. Right? It's inconceivable. Walk. Mark, I have a movie uh, homework for you if you have not seen it because you were a race walker. Have okay. you seen Queen Pins? No. You have now you gotta see it. I'm these doing ladies, it. these this lady is a she was an Olympic um, uh, race walker and yes. uh, she's she's bored, she's retired, and she starts couponing. And she starts running an illegal coupon scheme. Oh, scheme. It's okay. amazing. It's amazing. But race walking is her background. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. Mm. Queen Pins. Hey, your favorite movie. <laughs> Go ahead, Don. Craziest concert you've ever been to? Craziest? Wow. 
Well, I, I, boy, I, my, my most favorite comes to mind. I got to just, can I do that? Do you mind? Yeah. Yeah. It was sort of, yeah. for me, it was, a, it was this eye opening. The Doobie Brothers back in like 1981. <laughs> yes. Did they play Blackwater? That's what I want to know. Oh, of course they did. Yes. Oh, God, they played everything great. It was a fantastic concert. But for me, at the first real concert I ever went to as a kid, it was like, boing, holy cow, what's going oh my on God. here? What was it at Red Rocks? The row here? I mean, everything. It was nuts. Oh, my God. Did you go to, was it at Red Rocks? Were you? out there at the time no no i was oh. in, in colorado then oh my god okay that craziest concert i have my answer for that i went to red rocks to see uh, i hate to even admit this boy george you guys <laughs> <know what? laughs> oh, yeah, i can't believe i said it out loud that's perfect <laughs> do it do it again you do it again right <laughs> wow well, somehow that didn't make the list of things you sent nope. before the show no nope. but it, oh my god so are you are you into the karma chameleon no, I mean, not really. It was really, no. I wanted to see Red Rocks. A bunch of guys were going and their people were going and they said, you want to go? And I said, I got to see this place. Oh, I think I'd, I'd go to, uh, I'd sell my concert soul to see something at Red Rocks, but I didn't have another choice. I think right, that's right. That was really what it was. What a place. Too. Wow. Wow. We're learning so much about you, Mark. It's, <laughs> it's why we had, we had you on, right? So, uh, all right. I have one last question to ask you. I want to make sure I make, you know, get an opportunity for you to, to share with our listeners something big, something important. It is related to our work, but why the heck are you optimistic about this country oh, walking wow. physically active? You know, all the things that you have been working mm -hmm. so damn hard for the last yeah. bunch of years that why are you optimistic that maybe this country can, can actually get it in gear and, and see the outcomes that you've been hoping we'll see. Okay. Here's the interesting thing. It is not because climate change, finally we're accepting that and we got to do something about it. It's not because there's some great vision from a leadership level. It is, I'll be very honest, there's this next generation of young professionals of which, Don, hey Chris, you know, you and I've talked about this. I put you in this category. There's a handful of folks that are your peers and younger. Um, and, and, and Jessica, you know some of these people, right? You're working with them and you're trying to mentor them, I think. You know, we all are trying to think about this, Don. Um, and by the way, they're a lot more diverse than the generation, my generation, which was just a bunch of old white guys who made an awful lot of decisions about land use and transportation. And yet I see, I see young women, I see people of color, a lot of different backgrounds getting in fields like planning, but also engineering and public health and talking across those disciplines, right? There are people that come from backgrounds where it's not weird to talk to somebody that's not necessarily right in your box because they think differently about this stuff. So my hope is associated with the next generation of professionals and advocates that I see coming up. And I think one of our responsibilities when I say our, particularly older professionals like me, is do as much as possible to empower them, teach them what we know. They're so much smarter than us, they will go way beyond. They'll surpass us. They'll come up with cleverer ideas and better solutions. So my hope comes from that. But it's also sort of my responsibility as a result to be available to them if I can ever to be useful. Uh, awesome. Because that's what we've got to do. They're they're really going to be the ones. And I know yeah. I know all three of you enough and your work to know that you 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 think the same way. We're trying. Right. That's why you're doing a podcast for Christ's sakes. As the as the <laughs> two-time Olympian things. that you were, you're familiar with the notion of passing the torch, and there it that's, is. Uh, that's something that we're all trying to do. And now I think all three of us are now is probably in some way or another seeing even the next generation come along and and their ideas, right? Which is yeah. crazy hard to believe. But well, stumbles Fenton. We thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Any lasting thoughts before you head off into the wherever you're going to go? So are you going to catch some waves later on? Today? Yeah, I think I'm going to get in the water. I'm go. hoping. Yeah. Well, All it's just right. it, it, damn glad to be with you guys. And I love wow. what you're doing. Thanks. Keep it up. We appreciate you being on. I wish we could give you a, a National Park Service Ranger hat as a, a token of our appreciation, but you're going to have to earn that, my man. Yeah, Sorry okay. about that. Fair enough. Um, all right. Well, you all have been listening to another episode of the Planning Commission podcast, but before we adjourn, I need a motion. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Anybody? So moved. So moved. Seconded by, I hope, the only other person who can. Yep. There it is. Nope. Yes. Nope, we're not. Oh, there it is. The second it's official. We got to make it official. All right. This commission meeting is adjourned. We'll see you on the flip side. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate your time.